Welcome to I on the Illini. This is Mike Kegley, and I'm here with Matt Stevens. Matt has had the opportunity to go ahead and talk to the players, talk to the coaches after a, a, a victory where Illinois, after the opening drive of the second half, that defense put on their brass knuckles and they got out the baseball bats and they started breaking some kneecaps. What did, did you think and see from where your vantage point was, Matt? So it's interesting you worded it that way because I thought it was the opposite. I thought the defense found 11 fast guys and put them all on the field and then said, we're just going to run you. We're going to, we're going to outrun you. It's funny. I, I, I didn't think it was like tough man football. I thought it was especially like, look, give Aaron Henry a lot of credit today. Like, they they spent they've spent the last four I know this but they spent the last four weeks coming up with that third down package that they finally put out there today because they felt good about it especially with the players that are used in that third down package you saw those mass substitutions that were happening five six different guys running onto the field you noticed they were all fast guys you got Kiana and Ogaluga like playing defensive tackle in this package like. And Aaron Henry just decided, I'm, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to put 11 fast guys on the field and wherever they throw or toss or try to do quarterback option toward wherever, we're just going to go run to the football. We're going to have 11 guys run to the football and we're going to see if that works. We're going to see if speed works. And sure enough, speed works because Michigan State was 2 of 15 on third down today. And it's been a big problem with this Illinois defense is getting off the field on third down. Now, Michigan State was, I think, four or five or something stupid on fourth down. But they were two of 15 on third down. And I thought this defense for the last 25 minutes, the game was put on them and they responded and, and they answered the bell. And you knew there was going to be a game like this. And kudos to Aaron Henry and all of those guys that are role players. Kiana is a role player right now because he's still coming back from that massive lower body injury that he yeah. suffered in the spring. And Gentle Hunt is still trying to make the transition to big time football coming from FAMU. And he's not going to play four games, regular season games. So he actually has a chance, I think, to come back for another year. But he's carved himself out a role as a 22-year-old player from the Southwestern Athletic Conference from HBCU and really made his – took the last month – he's going to take the last month of the year to, to show what he can do at the Big Ten level. And guys like Malachi Hood and, and Sabor Kareem and even even a Mac Resetich who who started today, got his first career start today, and everybody in his hometown was basically here, which means like one – and they would have all filled one section here of Memorial Stadium in his entire hometown, but they were all here. And I thought he did a pretty darn good job – I think I saw, Mike, that like Michigan State had, I think it was like eight chunk plays the whole game, which is like plays that are more, pass plays that are more than 20, rush plays that are more than 15. I think they had seven or eight, and you can live with that, like in a defense. And I felt like you're right, Mike, I think in the sense of, I don't think they got out the big hammer and just whacked Michigan State with it. I think they got all the rabbits out on the field and just said, you can't run with us. And sure enough, Michigan State can't run with them right now. Aside from the the interesting decision to only rush three in that goal line situation, sure, Aaron yeah. Henry was masterful the whole game. And like I said, I, I haven't broke down the film, so there could have been something that happened that wasn't supposed to happen on that play. Like I said it in our game room, Mike, on our line, I guys, like, you guys can expect me to look at third down in this third down package in the film review because I'm fascinated by it. They finally put it out there and I'm fascinated by it. And the reason I'm fascinated by it is because you just don't normally see in a third down situation, six guys run on the field and six guys run off, like six starters run off. And so what Brett Bielema and Aaron Henry and, and these defensive coaches have done is they've taken six guys who weren't you know, playing a, a spectacular role on defense throughout nine weeks of the season and carving, allowing them to carve out themselves a role in a really important way so that this last month can be better than it was in 2022 and 2023. And, and kudos to Aaron Henry in his second year as a defensive coordinator going, hey, I don't know if these guys are every down guys, but, you know, they're fast enough. They have a talent that I, can, I need to get them on the field. He needed, He knows he needs to get KO on the field more than he has been, but there just hasn't been a role to carve out for him. And now there's a role to carve out for him. A lot of that has to do with Dylan Rosiak now being in a cast, but his leg being in a cast, 
but a lot of it doesn't. Like, and that's the one thing I thought that the defense looked shaky on was these quarterback option plays that Childs was running. That's a middle linebacker in James Crutes and or Malachi Hood, who's just not been out there much yeah. and overplaying, like overplaying the rush. And and when they take the quarterback, because the middle linebacker has to have the quarterback. And I think people a lot on TV see the quarterback running past Gabe Yakis. He's got the pitch man. He's supposed to be there. The guy that's supposed the guy that's not there in your in your television screen is either Malachi Hood or James Cruz, who's the middle linebacker, and the fact that he's not there is a big problem because he's either already run past the quarterback because he overran the play or he got there late. And so that was a big problem, I thought, in the first half. Illinois fi- Illinois fixed that as best they could. But I think that kid's going to be special later on in life for Michigan State. If he can get some offensive linemen and a couple of other skill guys around him, I think Jonathan Smith's got the potential of something special there. If he but- doesn't decide to go the in, who knows how many people are backdooring his and His like people. early on in the year, he had the, the tendency of handing or throwing the football to the other team. And that was a problem that younger players have too. Yep. They're gonna have to they're gonna have to teach some footwork and, and some accuracy stuff with him when they want to throw it. That's for darn sure. But his ability to change the game dynamically with his athletic ability really allows Michigan State to stay in a lot of games. But I look, I think Mike, you would even agree, and I would even agree. I get a little preachy sometimes. I don't understand. The, the I agree. The disconcertation of our board about Aaron Henry. I think this is one of Aaron Henry's better performances as a defense. Yeah, I thought. I mean, Illinois. look, that defense locked up. They locked up Michigan State in the, the second first half. Drive of the second half, there the, de- the whole game was put on them, and they responded in a way that that you know champions do. And quite frankly, complimentary football that Brett Bielema wants to play has to happen. And they did it. They got three and outs. They forced punts. They forced Michigan State to do some things they didn't want to do. And and then Aaron Henry, again, got creative with something that works. Now, the three-man rush when they're on the four-yard line, I, there's parts of, there's, there's, look, Aaron Henry is a, he's younger than I am. And he's legitimately younger than I am in age. And he's the second year as a defensive coordinator. I do think that there's a couple of times a game where he goes, I bet they're not even thinking I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And and I think a lot of people, when they get to be a little bit more experienced, go, you know why they're thinking I'm not going to do that? Because it's, it's not, not a good idea. It's not a good idea. <laughs> and and that's where Ian Henry outsmarted himself on the first bye week, where he was like, right. I bet Ryan doesn't think I'm going to do this. And then sure enough, like Purdue was able to scheme their way into a whole bunch of points because Aaron Henry outsmarted, outsmarted himself. And and. I don't feel like he did that a whole lot today, did that when Michigan State scored. But like, I felt like this was a more reflection of 2022, not the whole game, but so Michigan State goes down and scores and now it's suddenly yeah. it's 21 to 16. And I go back to the 2022 Wisconsin game where Wisconsin just dog walked the ball down the field and made it seven, nothing. And Ryan Walters grabbed his guys and said, okay, what's working? What's not? What do I have to throw out? You guys tell me. And I do feel like Aaron Henry, after that drive where Michigan State made it 21-16, Illinois, he grabbed his guys and was like, look, what's working? What's not? What can we do? And I think he got a lot of feedback. And he was like, okay, we're just going to do this. And until they stop us from being able to do this, and which was a lot of our third down package and our our, our, our specialty package stuff, if they don't stop that, we're just going to keep it on the field. And I think that's where... I'm going to be fascinated about the snap counts on defense because I think a lot of guys started the game but maybe didn't play a whole lot because they weren't in the sub package that worked right. out so well. And kudos to Aaron Henry, kudos to Corey Parker in the secondary room for scheming up a way to make Mac Rasidic in his first career start because Miles Scott is out with that suspension because of the targeting, giving him some confidence. I really only thought Michigan State burned him over the top on that one touchdown right. where literally Caleb Patterson hands – they're in they're in zone for the first time, I think, the whole day. Right. And Caleb Patterson is handing off that receiver to a safety who he thinks is there, and he's literally handing off the safety to nobody. To nobody, yeah. And Caleb's got to know that. He's got to know that, oh, shoot, there's nobody there. i got to go run with him. So that's – but I don't think they had played zone not more than once before that. So I think that's going to happen. And But, again, I felt like – I felt like Illinois did the thing that they've done all year defensively, more or less, except in this three-game losing streak, which was we're going to limit you to three if you get any kind of chunk plays and and move the ball at all. We're not going to let you get in the end zone. 
And well, and, and they didn't even let him in the red zone. I think that was one yeah. of the bigger differences. Like the Michigan. I State thought it was, was key, Mike. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I get these thoughts in my head, so I'm sorry. I thought it was key at the end of the half when they held him to three. I agree. And and I thought you could tell that even probably Aaron is thinking they're they're really gonna score at the end of this half again, right? But for them to get the sack and then the tackle for a loss and force like that that 39 yard field goal. That's a win for Illinois' defense. 21-9 to nine going into the half, that's fine. Everybody's cool with that. They come out and they make it 21-16, and Aaron's, guys, what did we just talk about? Like, the entire halftime, what did we just talk about? Tell me what's working. Tell me what I got to do. And I feel like Aaron Henry called his best game and then approached his job in the best way he has in that last 25 minutes of action maybe with nine minutes left to go in the third quarter throughout. I thought Illinois' defensive coordinator, that's the best work he's put on tape all year in the I last agree. two years. And and I think that's what Brett Bielema sees in Aaron Henry, and that's why Aaron Henry's going to be the defensive play caller at Illinois for a long time. And, and I also think, look, it wasn't great. Pass protection, again, was not great today. But I thought in the fourth quarter – Run blocking was pretty darn good. Like, I thought the inside zone was pretty good. I thought that the stuff that they ran with Josh McCray was pretty solid. And then I actually, I don't hate this running back by committee thing. I don't hate the three-headed monster running back kind of thing. I, I don't think it allows, the argument is it doesn't allow somebody to get into a role. It also doesn't allow for somebody to be really tired. And it also allows for guys to get on the field in their best way. Like, you could see how Aiden Loffrey starts out a drive. But if they get to third down, Josh McCray is your best pass protector. So we need to have him on the field. And then I even thought on some third down stuff, like I thought they picked it up pretty decently, like some on some occasions. The throw to Pat Bryant for the 40-yarder does not happen unless everybody, including the running back who was the, in there, pick up that blitz from Michigan State. I felt like that, that play that late in the second half where, where Luke hits, you know, uh, Pat Bryant on that crossing route and it allowed that drive to con at least continue. And I think it led to the Josh McCray touchdown running, rushing touchdown. That play doesn't happen unless everybody picks up their blitz assignment on the offensive line. Look, it wasn't, I'm not giving Bart Miller's group an A, but I'm certainly not giving them an F today. And, and so you saw gradual improvement. Look, they are what they are from guard to guard. They just are what they are. Okay. Right. I, I don't know. Everybody's, we'll play Kevin Wigington or play Desmond Schuster. Was, and I'm, I'm sitting there going, yeah, they could do that. But I'm in the back of my mind, I'm going, yeah, that'll solve it. They are who they are. And I think they got a physical victory in the second half with what they have to work with. And it wasn't terrible. And, and then again, you played 60 minutes of football where Luke Altmaier didn't turn it over. And that's what happens, right? Barry Lunny talks all the time about every drive has to end in a kick. It's either going right. to end in an extra point, a field goal, or a punt. And none of those options are terrible at the end of the day. And um, this is what complimentary football is. Don't turn it over, run the ball, stop the run, and then cover kicks, which is special teams, which I thought they were pretty special on special teams today. So that's how you get a 22-point, quote-unquote, boring win at home against a team that you should beat. And kudos to Illinois for coming out of the bye week and figuring out a way to do that. Yeah, I thought there were a few stats that jumped out at me. Sure. But you talked about third downs. Illinois was eight for 15, and, and Michigan State Kazuntite was two for 15. Then you look at red zone attempts. Michigan State was two for two, so they only got in there twice. Illinois was five for five. And when you start looking at, at that type of, of thing, it was big. And then Illinois, three for three penalties for 20 yards. That is what we all expected out of a Brett Bielma team and two of those were back to back on this and just unconscionable. So that that's basically a fantastic performance. And when you put those three things together, it's hard to lose when a team goes two for 15 and they only make it to the red zone two times during the game. Yeah. I, I, Illinois offense in the red zone has been one of the best in the country. Yep. Period. Gary Lunny, looked at what they did last year in the red zone, and he's I got to fix that. We got to somehow figure out a way to fix that. The way you fix it, quite frankly, is, A, again, he has always said, look, we have got to figure out a way to run the ball when we're in the, when we're in the red zone. 
on tape today, I think this is the best that Illinois has ever run the football in the red zone all year long, like especially late in the game with McCray and then with Aiden Loffrey. I think that's the, the best they've looked in the red zone running the football. The other thing he has said is, yeah, and then it really helps when I can get two guys on the outside like Pat Bryant and Zachary Franklin where we're going to win a lot of one-on-ones that way. And that's where I think red zone has been. And then I also have a quarterback in Luke Altmaier that, again, understands what we're trying to accomplish here and knows that the drive has to end in a kick. Now, Illinois hasn't been unbelievably proficient in getting seven every time in the red zone. They've been better than they were last year. But they sure get three, and right. and, and they're not going to leave without points. I can't remember how many times last year they got in the red zone and left without points. That was a big that was a big thing for Barry Lunny this past off season. And we need to be able to get points. And look, I think the key today is two things. I think third down defense was key because I I love what they did. I love what Aaron did today. I love what those coaches were able to to figure out in this bye week and in this week of preparation. And then I also thought the other key was just the ability for Illinois' offense to not beat itself, not either with penalties or with turnovers. Like punting wasn't the worst thing that this offense could do because they did not believe that today, at least, that Michigan State could go 85, 80, 85, 90 yards on them. They just didn't believe that was going to happen. And if they did, they were going to get three. They weren't going to get all the way in the end zone. That's a way for Illinois to win games and win them ugly. Iowa's been doing it for the last decade, folks. That's how Iowa wins football games and does it convincingly. Illinois won this game convincingly because I thought in the second half, they just suffocated Michigan State. And then they figured out the whole quarterback option thing because it's, hey, man, you've got the pitch guy. You've got the quarterback. You've got the dive tailback. Like, you don't think it's a real hard concept, but if everything is everybody isn't on a string defensively, like it can it's get really wonky. Like it really can. And quite frankly, I really thought that was really the only thing that Michigan State had offensively that they had going for them was right. Childs getting out on the perimeter and creating something with his feet. If that's the case and Illinois makes you play with one hand tied behind your back, then Aaron Henry's got gotcha you because he's already won at that point, because I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to call, and I know how we're going to play if you're going to be one-dimensional. Go back and watch the Michigan game. That was how Illinois dominated that football game. I felt today was very similar in the sense that, okay, we now know what Michigan State has to do in order to move the football, and so we can scheme around that. And there were things today that I felt like I, – I, I think the other thing that you can definitely conclude is that these guys took this bye week – in a much more productive fashion than they did the previous bye week. And that shows growth on a coaching staff and it shows growth as players. And I I think when you've got one of the younger teams in all of power conference football um, and you experience teams in all power conference football, and you're finding ways to to play much better in November than you have the last few years. And and you're finding ways to make guys play their best football um, in November, which is always key. There's a lot of positives that come out of today. This is the Run My Own Business dream. This is the College is Paid For dream. This is the Retire Early dream. This is Busey, where your dreams and possibilities become moments through trusted guidance and expertise, through lifelong relationships. Because we're here to help you achieve the life you've always envisioned couple questions on special teams. Why was Penton today? And did we see the emergence of Hank Beatty as a heck of a punt returner? Filling up 74 yards on Illinois' punt return, that's something that's unheard of because most of the time Illinois is happy with a fair catch and no yards. Totally strategic. The, first, the answer to your first question is totally strategic by Robbie Disher. If they needed a big leg kick, they, they decided that Breezy has had two unbelievable weeks of practice. Hughes struggled the last couple of weeks on full leg kicks. So we're going to make the change. And they made the change and he, Breezy looked really good on the first punt. So we're just going to continue to roll with it. Now, when we need somebody to trap them deep inside the 20 or inside the 10, you notice they went right back to Hugh because that's his, that's now his bread and butter right now. That might be something going forward for Hank Beatty. Again, 
the best punt returner that Illinois has had in a long time because he, he just has that ability. He has the ability to one, always catch the ball. And two, because of the way that he was taught at Rochester, it's not the it's not foreign to him to have the ball out in space. Like once he catches the ball and now he has it, right? Now it's just simply a yards after catch drill, right? Like where, okay, now I've got to make some moves and in, in the open field and try to get 12 more yards than I normally would. With the way that Rochester always played offense in high school, that was how they designed their offense was to get guys out in space yep. and have them have the defense miss tackles. That's the idea of a punt return. And yeah, and if you consider he's doing it still with – stitches in his finger because the bone went through his finger in the Minnesota game. And that's why he couldn't stay in the Minnesota game because he, he dislocated his finger so bad that it pierced the skin and he had to have stitches and they're like, the stitches will just break. We can't, he can't play anymore. They were able to figure out a way to glove him so that he doesn't break his stitches. And so he can catch punts again. And and yeah, I thought he, I, he was part of a really good day of special teams for, for, for Illinois. I thought Hank did a really good job. I thought Breezy did a really good job. David made his field goal look easy the way that he yep. normally does. And then even on that, even though on that operation, so Hugh Robertson isn't your primary punter, he's still your holder. And he got that ball for David in a way that I think that is underrated because if he doesn't make a hold like that, the three points doesn't happen. The operation on the field goal was pretty good. So everybody knows their role right now we talk about this a lot like in basketball terms we talk a lot about this in other sports but in football if you can find in the last month of the year guys that have been playing a very limited amount of snaps and say hey this is your role now like do your job like Bielema described it with malachi hood a, long, a while back where he he put him in this type of a role i i think the role that ko is in now on this third down package and the role that Jojo Hayden now is in behind him in this third down package. That's the role that Malachi was in earlier in the year. Dylan Rosiak breaks his leg and now Malachi has a bigger role, but Malachi was in that role and Bielema shouts him out on the more on the Friday walkthrough and Malachi knows exactly what the package is called. He want, he knows exactly what his job is and says it in front of the entire team. And then sure enough, the next day he goes out and he gets a fumble recovery against Michigan in that role, in that package. And I think that KO has been trying to get back off this ankle injury that is just unbelievably severe that could have probably cost him this entire year if he, he hadn't rehabbed it properly. And he did. But it's an ankle Achilles thing that just just hampered him the whole beginning of this year. And, and I'll be fascinated to see his snap counts because, Mike, I have this ongoing thing with Kevin Ducey right now where like he wants him to play like 50 snaps and I think Illinois figured out a way for him to be productive in 12 snaps he's got to be the most productive like 10 to 12 snap player in college football because they just put him out there he knows his job and then he comes off the field and T-Rod goes back out there as a normal defensive tackle and everybody you know doesn't know what the heck happened and I also think here's the other thing that I think Aaron Henry has figured out as a defensive coordinator in a very brilliant way in his second year, I think he and Jamo have both figured this out because Jamo was doing this last year. If we sub practically every play, the if, if we have the Big Ten has this thing where they haven't done, they haven't figured out the SEC or the Big Twelve thing yet. Where it's if you're on offense and you sub, guess what? The defense gets to sub too, and now exactly. you're not your offense isn't going the way it's supposed to go. Ohio State's figured out that we can keep the same guys on the field and the defense is screwed. Oregon's figured this out. Even Penn State's kind of figured this out a little bit with Andy Kolecki. And LA, Illinois has during parts of games. Sure, yeah. And I think even Indiana's figured it out occasionally when they want to. But there's big time teams that just haven't figured it out. And I think that Illinois knows, okay, you subbed. Well, we're going to sub with four people. And, and we're going to slow this game down for my guys on defense. And I don't want their head spinning. So if you give Aaron Henry and Terrence Jamison an opportunity to sub, guess what? They're going to do it. It's almost like their opportunity to legally fake an injury. Is it, but it's not because it's like, hey, you subbed. I get to counter, man. And it, I, I, they've really used that rule in 2024 to their advantage. And I, I thought they did today in an amazing way where you, I, 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 like I'm a big NHL guy. People wanted to call it hockey subs out in my, I was like, dude, there's only five hockey players out on the field or on the ice every night. Like 
they were subbing like six guys like per third down and, and guys were running on the field and running off. And I talked to T. Ryan Edwards about it, who's one of the guys that's running off. And he's probably going to be an all Big Ten honorable mention guy at the end of the year. He's running off the field for somebody who's 230 pounds playing his position right. for one down. But they're all buying in because they think it works. And they also think it's really cool that, like, finally, Gentle Hunt has found his way of contributing. And KO has found his way of contributing. And JoJo Hayden has found his way of contributing right now. And that's coaching, man. That's allowing guys to take pride and ownership in their job, whatever their job is. And and that's how championship teams end up performing like they did today. And I, I just, again, I think for 60 minutes and certainly for the last 25, this is the best this is the best on tape that Aaron Henry's defense has looked at Illinois. Good. Illinois is the one team now in the league who can go nine and three. Everybody, <laughs> the top four teams will obviously sure. be in double digit wins and no one else can get to nine except for Illinois playing at Rutgers. Who've, who've had a tough back half of the season have had some injuries. How do you look at that game next week? Just from a very much a, a sketch standpoint, Mike, they should get to nine and three. I think they're going to be favored against Rutgers. I think it's, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Illinois is going to be on the edge of being ranked on Monday afternoon, or I'm sorry, on on tomorrow afternoon, on Sunday in the AP poll at seven and three with two losses to number one and maybe number four ish, three, and then a Minnesota team. That's probably the one where you cock your head and go, yeah, it's even a six, but it's a six win Minnesota team. Sure. Yeah. That's their worst loss. Like when your other two losses are to one and to three or four. It's it's better than Notre Dame with the NIU. Right. Exactly. But I think Illinois is going to be favored in New Jersey when they go to Piscataway to play Rutgers. I think that rosters wise, they're about at the same, and Rutgers has been just hit with injury after injury, and I don't think their quarterback's very good, and I don't yeah. think I think they're going to try to win it in a one-dimensional fashion running the football. Guess what? You just played right into the hand of the way Aaron Henry likes to call defense and in a primary way. I, I think they should be favored. And then, Mike, I don't have to tell you this, being an Illini fan for as long as you you have been, but two-thirds of that crowd at Wrigley Field in a couple in, in a few weeks are going to be orange and blue. It's not going to be purple. I even think you probably saw it today where it was probably a whole bunch of scarlet and gray in Wrigley Field today, and it wasn't a whole lot of purple. Like yeah, there, there was certainly a lot of – Let's, some, let's call some, it spade to spade yeah. here. So we all know that there's a whole bunch of Illini fans near the north side of Chicago and even the south side of Chicago, and, and they certainly show up every time Illinois plays a home basketball game in Welsh Ryan. They're going to show up at Wrigley Field. So – I think in a home slash neutral environment for the Illini, they should be favored and should win that football game. That gets you to nine and three. And then that's, you know, I talked to the the cheese at Citrus Bowl rep today and he's man, if, if at nine and three, we're having a, we're having a real conversation about who Illinois is going to play. Right? And that was my point is that Illinois yeah. would be your fur if assuming that the SEC doesn't steal a spot or two in the CFP, Illinois could be the number one pick for a January 1st bowl well, this the, year. The, the, yeah, unless I'm being hoodwinked here because I'm not exactly entirely sure how the bowl selection works because I don't really haven't thought I had to worry about it, let alone really thought it. The bowl system has been in the back of my way back in my mind because I don't know how many of these games people really care about anymore in the 12 team format. But the cheese at Citrus Bowl guy today said that they have the first pick. Um, among Big Ten and SEC selections uh, that don't go to the 12 team, right? Yeah. And again, he was he had pointed out to me that look, if Illinois is nine and three after the game at Wrigley Field, we're not having a conversation about who we're taking from the Big Ten. We're having a conversation about who Illinois is going to play because Georgia. Now we're, having, now we're having a conversation about what El- what SEC team Illinois is going to play, and that's when it gets scary for Illinois fans. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I think. Here's what's interesting, Mike, is that I think Minnesota can get to eight and four, but I think they have to beat Penn State in order to do it. I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues here on this line. I'd be like eight and four might get Illinois to the Citrus Bowl in Orlando because I, I, I don't think Illinois, I don't think the Citrus Bowl is going to take Iowa for the third straight time. I just don't, even though those people travel. Yeah, like, and, and, know, and Wisconsin, like would, or they also have to play. Not only that does for them to get to because because right now Minnesota's sitting on six and four, right. But they play next week at home. But it, you're, as you said, it's Penn State, and then they have to go to their rivalry game on the road at Wisconsin, which 
I, I, is not an automatic either. They, they have to win the Axe in Madison, which you can ask the Illinois coach how hard it is to do that if you're Minnesota, and yeah. that's not a given. Iowa can't get to nine. I don't even know if they no, can get to nobody eight. can. It's just I don't Illinois. think they can get to, I, I, I think it's going to be hard for Iowa to get to eight at this point. It sure looks like if Illinois takes care of business in Piscataway, I just feel like Illinois is going to take care of business in Wrigley Field. I don't have a whole lot of hope for that Northwestern team. David Braun's done an excellent job just keeping – leaks uh, hundreds of leaks out of the boat but right, right. they haven't had the same kind of turnover luck that they had last year um right. quite frankly and and i think the the roster talent level that david braun has now inherited is starting to catch up with northwestern as it normally does after spectacular seasons that northwestern has illinois should win that game too and so at nine and three you're, you're trying to figure out is, is, is illinois going to play like an alabama who doesn't get into the 12 team are they going to play an lsu that doesn't get into the 12 team are they going to play a South Carolina that doesn't get into the 12 team? Like, which SEC team is Illinois going to well, draw? And there's going to be, uh, Matt, uh, to be honest with you, there is the opportunity to literally have as as many as seven teams from the SEC end up at 10 and 2. So sure. you, you could have literally now, obviously Tennessee would have to lose to Georgia. Texas would have to, would have to lose to Texas A&M, but you could have, you know, just a boat. You didn't knock me on my, but yeah, but you didn't knock me on my butt with either one of those. So yeah, it was just, maybe there's some good football to be played. And yep. Illinois could play Tennessee, Texas A&M, Georgia, Ole Miss, Alabama, or Missouri. And that's, but that's what you're, that's what you want to become a big team you want to be a big time college program that's what you got to do so put your big boy pants on and have some fun let's play on new year's day let's play and let's play an sec team let's see what we can do and let's flip a few guys or when we go portal shopping maybe we're a place that people want to be i think that happened i think that happened in 2022 i think that happened yep. i think it could happen again luke altmeyer picked illinois because he saw illinois playing on january 1 and knew that was a place where i want to go so, yeah, I think that could definitely happen. I think that this program is certainly going in the right direction. I think that, and then at the end of the day, also, I want to make this very clear, just because I think we have a lot of people on our board that are going to be dissatisfied if and when this happens. Let Illinois go. I, I'm not trying to do the F, or, like the F around and, and find out kind of logic here, but let Illinois go nine and three. And then you don't think Brett Bielema is going to bring back the entire staff from a nine and three team at Illinois? Like, He's going to bring back the entire staff from a nine and three team at Illinois. And what I also think, I, I talked about this with a colleague on the field at the end of the game. Look, if you don't think Brett Bielema and Josh Whitman are going to sit down again after nine and three, and, and I don't even know if that conversation is about Brett getting more money. I think it's a conversation about two things. I think it's a conversation about Josh. I need more. I need more pay for play money, which is say, a conversation that should be happening wants, at eight and four yeah. and should be happening at seven and five. Eight. Too right, but it's but I think it's also going to be a conversation of hey, because I've heard Brett say this, Josh. I'm rich, I'm already rich. Pay my guys, pay my guys so they'll stay here. Like, how about Illinois permanently become a million dollar coordinator place? Like, how about Barry Lunny now suddenly is now a seven figure coordinator? How about Terrence? If you, I think Terrence Jameson's the best defensive line coach in America. Like, I want him to be paid like one of the best defensive line coaches in America. Pay my guys. Because I think Brett could tell you a whole bunch of stories about how at Wisconsin and Arkansas, he lost a whole bunch of his guys because his bosses didn't value the assistant coach pool and said, and then he would lose guys and he'd get really frustrated about it. He got frustrated as hell with Barry about it in, in Madison. I know that happened. So I just feel like there's so many good conversations that are going to happen between Josh Whitman and, and, and Brett Bielema who already have a very functional relationship to start with. Those two are, are really in sync on a lot of things. It, it's going to be a really interesting off season, but I do think Mike, sorry, the kind of rambled here, but the basis of your question is yes, I think Illinois should be nine and three at the end of all of this. And I think that I'm not saying they couldn't get nipped at, at, at Rutgers in road game, but yeah. Illinois is going to be favored in that game. And so if you're favored in that game, go win it. I, I think that Illinois, and then at the end of it all, Mike, is that I think we just talked about the micro, but the macro is, God love these kids, but I didn't think that they were going to win more than five, six games this year. Like I so, had them at I had them at six and six, Matt, and, and you I know struggled. I had them a little. I think I had them a little worse than six and six. Well, I don't know that that finding that sixth game was a little hard. 
Yeah, and I, I and, said it to you, Mike. If they lose the Kansas game, this could get really ugly really quick. And nine and three in 2024 with what everything everybody thought on August one. That's remarkable. Kudos to Brett Bielema and everybody in that building for figuring out a way to do that with also, again, one of the youngest rosters in power conference football. And, and, and to think that if your culture is the way you think it is, Brett, a lot of those guys are going to come back. And a lot of those guys are going to be guys that are going to play in 2025. Yeah, I, I just oh, think that I'm going to run really through a, a few things. A lot of good things came out of today that, that lead you into 2025. I'm going to run through a few things from a stat standpoint, because I think this is worth talking about. Sure. Because as a 57 year old, I started watching Illinois with the zero to zero tie that I got, that I sat in the end zone for a dollar. One of the people that when they threw that first pass that you, you gave him a standing, you gave Mike quite a standing ovation. Yeah. Trust me. But this was Gary Moeller and the, the drags of, of zero to zero tie against Northwestern. Sure. And so now uh, Brett Bielma improves to 25 and 22 during his Illinois career since Robert Zupke went undefeated in two of his first three seasons at Illinois from right. 1913 to 15. Bielma's 25 and 22 start is second best through 47 games behind only Mike White and his 16 Big Ten wins in his first four seasons are the most since Lou Tepper won that in 92 through 95. He's tied for third most Big Ten wins through four seasons amongst Illinois' 13 coaches in modern history. He's behind only Mike White and John Mack. And then when you look at season, the average attendance was 54,750. So the paid attendance, not always people in the seats. And no, that's the single like, highest. Like the attendance, the single highest. Highest. I don't mean to cut you off. The attendance was, uh, it butts in seats today. Attendance was pretty darn good. Yeah. And that's the best single season average since 2009. I don't and then think you Brad go, Bielo mentioned that at the end of the night. He sure did. He should. And he, Illinois went 6-1 and one this year, the first time they've won six games at home since 2001. Yep, sure and their 20, their 22 point margin of victory over the Spartans is the biggest since a 40-17 to 17 win that I watched at Memorial Stadium in 1984 when I was a senior in high school playing football for Muhammad Seymour. So that tells you how. And so when the first article I wrote when we started the Illini guys Mm -hmm. was the mountain in front of Brett Bielma. And I talked about how bad the system, how bad Illinois football has been for so long. And I, I will tell you, I was not thrilled with Brett Bielma as the hire. I was like retread. I'm going to tip my cap to him. He is turning this program into something respectable. I'm not trying to say he didn't have the benefit of being Kurt Signetti and bringing a championship team from a lower level with you. Yeah, he couldn't bring the Giants players to Champaign. Yeah, he couldn't. If, if Brett would have brought the Giants players, I right. would have been happy. We wouldn't right. have wanted the Cowboy players. Lord knows that. But right. But look, the, the point is when you look at this program, he has started to make it respectable. I live down here in Dallas. When I first got here, people would ask me if Illinois has a football program. Now people are like, oh, yeah, they're pretty good, aren't they? And they think Illinois is a pretty good football program. That's Brett Bielma and Josh Whitman. People can say what they want, but those two guys are the guys who've put the plan together and maybe didn't move as fast as some people would like. Again, it's hard to to dictate that, but, but what he has done here is revolutionize what Illinois football means and he isn't doing the spike year, which is what was so famous. Hey, let's go 0 and 11. And then two years later, we'll go 11 and 1. And then two years, we'll go 10 and 2. And then two years later, we're back to 5 and 7. Five yeah, and seven. 2 and 10. Yeah, no, I, mean, I, I think I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest this might not be a dead cat bounce kind of thing in 2024 for Brett Bielema. I completely agree, Mike. I think you have to give everybody in that building, including Brett Bielema, a lot of credit. A lot of people in that Smith Center. I put in a lot of work, not only just the last few months, but the last few years to get to this point where Illinois is consistently putting out a roster that is comparable to Michigan State. 
and putting out a roster that is comparable to Minnesota and putting out a roster that, quite frankly, on a really special Saturday in the fall was comparable to Michigan's roster and, and in certain ways. And I think that there's I, I do think that there's a lot. to Look, I had a lot of concern after the way that 2023 ended where this thing was headed. And I think for this group to rally and this group to really hone in on what, okay, I think it would have been, here's what I'll say is that I think it would have been easy for, I think you can look at this from a micro and a macro sense. Let's just do it that way. I think after 2023, it would have been easy for a lot of the guys in the building, including Brett Bielema to panic a little bit um, and, and get away from their principles and get away from what they believe in. They didn't do that. And they just keep kept building and kept building. And, and suddenly now they're winning top 25 games and they're ranked. And all of those things happen because you build something in your culture that allows for things to flourish. In the micro, I think it would have been easy for this group to panic after three straight losses. Like you lose the Oregon, you, you lose the uh, the Oregon game, the, what was the game after that, the Minnesota game. It, it would have been easy to panic. It would have been yeah. easy to say, hey, this Here isn't we- going right. This is we're, we're, something's going wrong here. This isn't this. Brett talked about not letting Oregon beat them the next week against Minnesota. They did. Now they have a bye week and they go, oh, shoot. Like this could get real rocky real quick. And it, and it didn't happen. They used the bye week properly. They figured out things. They, they tried some new things. Sure enough, they worked. And, and you get a 22 point win against a Big Ten opponent. And so. I think it would have been easy to to say, "Hey, this is this thing's going to finish the exact same way in November it has in 2022 or in 2023," and it doesn't look like that's going to happen, or at least right now. And so, kudos to them for that. I also want to give a lot of credit to a lot of people in that building. I, I think I want to give a lot of credit to the, the players in that locker room. Like, I'll end it like this, Mike. It was senior day today. I know that doesn't mean a whole lot in the in the <laughs> the pay for play era and and the portal era that we're in. But in all seriousness, Pat Bryant's the best wide receiver at Illinois since. Fill in the blank, Mike. Brandon Lloyd? Like, yeah, Regis um, Ben or, yeah, Brandon yeah, Lloyd. Yeah, really Ben, Brandon Lloyd. Like, some of those guys. I think Pat Bryant has turned into a guy that some fringe power schools wanted him at the end. And he was a lovey recruit, but wanted him at the end. He's going to get a chance to get drafted and play on Sundays. Like, that's going to happen. Um Illinois stayed true to who they were, stayed true to a two-year commitment or recruitment to Zakari Franklin, and you're seeing how that's paid off now this year. He's a special talent. I think he's going to get a chance to play potentially on Sundays. I think I'll give you another one, which is weird because it's another nose tackle that might go undrafted, but I think he's going to get into a camp, is, and he might even get drafted, is, is T.R.I. Edwards, like yeah. a guy that replaced – Dylan Rosiak today on senior day as a captain, as a captain at the coin toss. And I think he's played brilliantly at that nose tackle position in the same kind of way that Johnny Newton played last year. And Keith Randolph played that position a little bit sometimes. And and you've seen that nose tackle position when Illinois defense has been really good, be filled by guys that somehow get into NFL camps. And, and then you've, you've, you watch guys on defense. I think Gabe Yakis is going to play on Sundays. I think Seth Coleman's going to get a chance to go to a combine and show people his length. He's going to get to <laughs> – Seth Coleman and Gabe Yakis, I believe, are going to stand in their underwear at the Senior Bowl in Mobile and impress somebody in professional football enough to bring them into camp and or draft them. I thought they had a big-time game today. Slowly but surely, in the way that Brett Bielema has always wanted to build this, even at guys like me that yelling and screaming at him that you need to be going and and doing more in the portal. You need to be doing more in the pay for play world. He's producing NFL players at Illinois in in the way that hasn't happened in a long time. And quite frankly, it's why I picked Illinois to win today. If you look at it, roster one through 85 today in terms of scholarship players, I think there's more NFL guys on this roster right now than Michigan state has on their roster. And so I think that Illinois is building something that's deeply competitive in, in the middle, you know, middle to upper tier of the Big Ten that I think is sustainable. And I do think that the progression also of a guy like he wasn't honored today, which I thought was very telling, but didn't go through senior day, which I thought was very telling. Talked about how much he's going to miss Pat Bryant and Zakari Franklin next year which is very telling, but Luke Altmeyer is going to graduate in December from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, but has spoken like a guy who's going to come back next year as a third-year starter. 
But the progression of from 2023 to 2024 of Luke Altmaier, week to week, play to play, and game to game has been truly remarkable for me to, me to watch because somebody who literally struggled with turnovers, like when he got here and struggled with turnovers at, against Minnesota, that we, we thought, oh God, here we go again. And the ball security thing was going to happen. He left today with no turnovers. And I thought he, he said today, he said, that, man, I really put that ball in jeopardy a couple of times. And I looked at him and I'm like, dude, there were a lot of times you could have done some really stupid stuff. And you decided to throw the ball into the second row of, the, of Memorial Stadium. And quoting the current senator in Alabama, but former Alabama coach or Auburn coach, Tommy Tuberville, lived to punt, folks. Like, it's not the worst thing in the world that's ever happened in a drive. Luke Altmaier kind of won by being boring today. And I also thought I wanted to give credit to Michigan State. I know that I, apparently they did this on the broadcast a whole bunch that they haven't had a sack since September. Yeah, it was basically Illinois's porous offensive line leading the league in sacks versus uh, Michigan a sackless. Yeah, so it right. was the movable object against the right. resistible force. So here's what of- Michigan, here's what Jonathan Smith and Michigan State's defense did is that Luke Altmaier literally said to us tonight, like it was the most exotic third down defense they've seen all year long and stuff they did not see on tape all year, all, all week. And what that tells me is that Michigan State got finally got tired of not putting any pressure on the quarterback exactly and just said the hell with it we're going to try this like and even if it doesn't even if we get burned on it the hell with it and i don't care what sport it is whether it's football or basketball or hockey or or anything if you haven't seen it on tape you're not going to react well to it in the moment initially and illinois offensive line didn't react well to stuff early on i thought they did a better job of it in the second half of at least keeping luke up and that's again they're it's funny, Mike, you've said this before. I'll say it now. Brett Bielen was doing this with, I think, duct tape and barbed wire at two of the most important positions he feels like in football, which is offensive line and defensive line. And yeah. if they can ever get special people at either one of those two position groups, like, God help them. Imagine if Keith Randolph and Johnny Newton were on this team. That's a pretty special – that's a college football playoff rock, right? Yeah, that's a top-10 team, yeah. Yeah, and so and that's, at that That's point, where I think ultimately Illinois – when we talk about the future, the next piece right. is how do you get the Mark Cuban guy to help underwrite the football program here? We obviously – Shad Khan's done a wonderful job and been a, a friend of the university. But who's the next big-time donor? Or – do you do a ground level stuff where people go to icon for com and your average Joes are donating? And because I'll tell you, if you gave Brett Bielma the a couple defensive linemen and a couple offensive linemen, as you're talking about, this team would maybe only have one loss this year. Red Grange wasn't just a football player. He was a legend. Discover the untold story of Illini great Red Grange in a new novel by Doug Vilhard called The Golden Age of Red. This captivating book takes you back to the 1920s when a humble young Illinois player transformed into the galloping ghost and electrified the nation. Get your copy of The Golden Age of Red by Doug Vilhard today. Available on Amazon and wherever books are sold. Yeah, I, I, here, here's the easy way. I know we got to get going here, Mike, but it's, I'll finish with this point. And I, I, maybe you'll disagree with me, but, and you know how much I, I sometimes hate to do the basketball football comparison here at the U of I, but I'll do it anyway today. I think the next step for Underwood was always trying to find the one and done players, like a Kasparis, Jakis Jonas, and a Will Riley potentially to get Illinois to that next level. They're doing that now. I think the next step for Illinois is to find those special players that are big people. I think Illinois fans have a lot of concern about what wide receiver is going to look like after Sakari Franklin and Pat Bryant. I would tell people to not worry about that so much. I think Justin Stepp is that good a coach, a good developer of talent. And I think there's, there's folks in the pipeline that when given the opportunity, like Pat Bryant was given as an upperclassman, they could shine. And, and, you, and especially with potentially a third year starting quarterback in Luke Altmaier, if that's the case, where I have concern and I think where everybody in that building has concern is, and I think that fans under undervalue this sometimes just out of sheer what I want to see on television type of thing. 
it's got to be more big people. It's got to be people that are 300 pounds and more. Uh, that's going to make a huge difference for Illinois because quite frankly, Mike, those are the two most hardest positions to recruit, especially in the Midwest, especially for Midwest schools. It's not an, it's not a, it's not a coincidence that it's really hard for these middle tier big 10 programs to recruit great defensive linemen and why they're always going into the portal for off for defensive linemen. It's not a secret why a lot of the big 10 schools are going into the portal for offensive linemen. If Brett Bielema can make a difference in both of those position group places with the future talent that he's bringing to Illinois, that's the, that's the next step. That's the next step to where you go from good to great in my opinion. And then I think that Brett Bielema knows that. And then I think that a lot of people connected, let's just say connected to the Illinois program or should be connected to the Illinois program are going to hear that message loud and clear too. And, and it's an easier message to hear Mike after Illinois goes nine and three than when they go five and seven, it's just an easier message yep. to hear. And, and today I felt, I don't know how you felt about it today, but Today just felt like a, a game in which Illinois was determined to not lose it themselves because they felt like they were as good, if not better, talent for talent, player for player than Michigan State. That is where your football program is right now today, Illini fan, if that's after what, four hours of what you just saw. Your roster right now is, is at a better place than Michigan State's roster is right now. Your roster is at a better place than Purdue's roster is right now. Your roster is at a better place than Wisconsin and Iowa's roster is, in my personal opinion. I don't know that I thought I was going to be saying that on August 1st, but the, but the development job of a lot of the guys in that building that I'm looking at across the street from Memorial Stadium right now is pretty remarkable. And, and this was just a win that if Brett Bielema gets this rocket and roll in the way that he wants to at Illinois, and he hasn't, we haven't gotten all the way there yet, but if he does, these are the kind of wins I think you're going to see over and over and over again um, as an Illini fan. Perfect. We'll wrap it there. I, it's a good day to be an Illini fan. The Illini have beaten Michigan and Michigan State in the same season for the first time since 1983. Before I was so, born. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So that, that, that is a... <laughs> Chris going to ignore that was to block him right off the thing. But no, so it's a heck of a day to be an Illini fan. I think we're seeing a transformation in this football program. I don't say that lightly, but I'm just telling you, you can tell that, that the program is being built. This is going to be a big week. Illinois plays Rutgers on Saturday, 11 uh, a.m. Central time on Peacock. Another fun stream, streaming adventure for those of you who got to watch Netflix last night. Peacock, I think, will do a better job, and I don't think there's going to be 65 million people trying to watch this particular game. But we will have on an expert from Rutgers on Monday night on I on the Illini. And, of course, Wednesday, Illinois plays Alabama. So we will have our halftime live show and our post-game show live as well. So there's a lot going to be going on before Saturday. And, of course, Illinois has that opportunity to go and get their eighth win and march towards the Citrus Bowl, which would be really cool. And we will be there with you every step of the way. Of course, you can subscribe at Illini Guys for 27 cents a day. You get all of our podcasts, you get all that, but you also get all the news stories that we have. A lot of them are behind the paywall, so you get access to those. You also get things early. And the bottom line is you get the message boards where you can debate the people on the staff, ask questions about why we say what we say. And it makes for a more two-way relationship as opposed to belonging to some place that you're just reading the stories or listening to somebody talk without the opportunity to interact and make it a two-way street. So we would love to have more people join the Illini guys, $99 a year. You get the first six days to kick the tires. The seventh day, you get the bill. So it's easy. It has the prices haven't went up since we started. We have our Illini Guys Sports Spectacular. It's our weekly two hour radio show. You can get that across the state of Illinois. Matt's on almost every week, Ked's on almost every week. Brad and I and Larry are on every week. We cover Illini sports and Big Ten sports very thoroughly. So please take the opportunity to look for that show or at least get the podcast just like you subscribe to I on the Illini. We have our YouTube channel as well, IlliniGuys.com. And we have our Big Ten show, Big Sports Radio. 
and you can get that on a weekly basis. It is Big Ten sports. There's some intersection, obviously, with the Illini, and we would love to have more people subscribing to that show. And if you like sports where we don't scream and yell at coaches, we don't scream and yell at college kids, and we don't talk politics, that might be a nice two-hour break in your week as well. With that, we will see you on Monday night. Go Illini.